Hello and welcome to another episode of Divorce TV. And we've got a beautiful healing, a really interesting one at the end of the show, so make sure you're all ready for that. And a very interesting interview I did, it's pre-recorded with Karen Baru, who's a very experienced psychotherapist who'll have a few good things to say. Now first though we will look at the news. first story comes from the Daily Mail. Rachel Lee Cook's husband, Daniel Gillies, has filed for divorce from the She's All That star after 15 years of marriage. Now the divorce was filed last Friday according to The Blast on Wednesday. Rachel and Daniel shared daughter Charlotte six and son Theodore five. The thespians tied the knot in 2004 after dating since 2001. I'm their intention is clearly to make this as peaceful as possible. So good luck guys and keep it sweet. The next story from the mirror is uh, an example of what can go horribly wrong. Um, so don't let your divorce end up like this one. Actually the divorce has already happened. But the agony is still continuing. Hollywood actor Johnny Depp has returned to London's High Court for his ongoing libel battle against newsgroup newspapers. Broke Johnny Depp handed Amber Heard a divorce settlement sum of $7 million, despite losing his $650 million movie fortune, a court heard. The actor 57 returned to London's High Court as his libel case against the newsgroup newspapers continues. The actor is suing NGN over a story published in The Sun in 2018 that branded him a wife-beater, a claim he strenuously denies. During the hearing, Depp's finances were brought up again, with the actor's lawyer David Sherburn telling the court how much the actor paid during his divorce from Heard. Sherburn said Depp paid Heard $7 million her $525,000 legal costs and wrote off liabilities incurred during their marriage, which his accountant said totaled several, several millions of dollars. Heard later insisted she donated her divorce settlement to charity. This all comes days after the court heard Depp explain how he lost his entire movie fortune of $650 million and was left $100 million in debt just months before he split from Heard. During his testimony, Depp said he found out the bad news shortly before his then wife Heard's 30th birthday party on April the 21st, 2016. He had a meeting at which he discovered his former business managers had cost him a huge amount of money. The court heard how Depp wanted to run a DNA test on the poo found in his bed to determine who it belonged to. The star had said the incident marked the end of his marriage and he believed Heard or one of her friends had done it but she insisted it was one of their Yorkshire Terrier dogs. A picture showed in court also revealed the former couple's kitchen at a rented house in Australia covered in blood after an incident in which Depp's finger was severed. He claims the injury occurred when Heard threw a vodka bottle at him, while the actress says he heard himself smashing a plastic phone against a wall when she was in another room. What all this has got to do with his libel case, I'm not really sure, but it just shows that if you have a very messy divorce, it can go on being messy for quite a long time. Now a more positive story to end on. Kelly Clarkson was left speechless by a 12 year old uh, in his message about overcoming loss and sadness, but confessed it's what she needed to hear. The 38 year old talk show host was blown away, blown away by the preteen's words about positive thinking to propel life forward amid her emotional divorce from Brandon Blackstock. Kelly has appeared emotional on her talk show since she filed for divorce from husband Brandon Blackstock on June the 4th. Kelly and her talent manager, X, 43, share five-year-old daughter River Rose and four-year-old son Remington Alexander. She's also a stepmom to Seth, 13, and Savannah, 18, from Brandon's previous marriage. According to documents obtained by The Sun, Kelly filed papers in Los Angeles on June the 4th and cited irreconcilable differences as the reason for the split. 
The singer requested joint legal and physical custody, though asked the court to not award Brandon any spousal support in the paperwork. As she filmed her hit NBC show from her LA home, Kelly chatted with Giles from Fort Worth, Texas. The impressive middle schooler wrote a book called Never Give Up, which helps others overcome depression and loss. Giles explained that many people want to simply quit when battling negative thoughts. He then advises to live life with a full battery mentality and replace the mindset with only positive thoughts. As he continued his inspiring message, Jelly, sorry, Kelly was speechless with her mouth wide open as she listened in. The voice coach then exclaimed, wow, oh my gosh, before stumbling over her words in disbelief. She continued, I know everybody out there, somebody else probably needed this message too, but so did I. I cannot believe I'm learning so much from a 12 year old. We need to shut up and listen to children. Couldn't agree more with you, Kelly. Hello, I'm going to now introduce you to Karen Baru. Karen is a psychotherapist. She's going to tell us a little bit more about herself. So welcome, Karen. I'm now bringing you into view. Thank you. I'm Karen Baru, qualified psychotherapist, um, trained and licensed in the USA, been in the UK for the last 20 years, I'm part of the BACP. And one of my specialties in my practice is working with families of all sorts. Um, and specializing in couples and relationships and how, how to help couples resolve the issues of bringing together either blended families or conflicting marriage families or whatever the, the system that needs to change within families are. So that really is my passion. And I guess watching people change the way they live their lives is for me an extremely rewarding part of what I do. There's a very famous researcher called Judith Wallerstein, who's one of the most respected divorce researchers in the world, actually. And about five years ago, she published a book where she had followed children of divorce for 30 years, and um, some of them even longer, and had then interviewed them um, all through the stages of the divorce and the impact that the divorce had on them. And I guess the best conclusion from this is that it is not the divorce that hurts children. It is the war between the parents. And one of my greatest passions is to work with the couple, to work out the anger, the loss, the feeling around letting go of a dream so that they have a neutral slate to co-parent their children so that their children don't land up growing up in a war zone because it is that war zone that damages the children. So one of my greatest missions with couples of any stages is, you know, sometimes even married couples who are warring all the time, they're actually living like divorced couples within a marriage. So, and often what I do see is people will get divorced and ten, I've had couples who've come to me 10 years after their divorce and they're still basically in the marriage they're just living in separate homes as separate partners, but when it comes to dealing with each other and the war that the children are involved in, because the children become the target of the war, and they're almost living the exact same as they were in the marriage, and they get quite shocked when I say that to them, but then we start to unpack the war. So the best present any divorcing or conflicting relationship can give to their children is to work out their own anger on their own without their children, and help the children grow up in an environment that's safe emotionally for them. You brought your children into the world and it is your responsibility to provide a safe, loving environment for your children where they don't have to choose between a mommy and a daddy. They don't have to choose between who's more important and integrating other partners because the smaller the war, the better integrated the other partners are as well. Thank you, Karen. I wanted to ask specifically about the, the challenges of co-parenting. So when you've got other partners on the scene, because that does seem to be a, a huge issue. What are the kind of mistakes, common mistakes people make that you could help um, help them avoid, particularly also helping people to understand things from the child's point of view? So, you know, it's very interesting that co-parenting because in I'm going to start with married couples. 
most married couples do not work on the same page in parenting. So no matter how good your relationship is, you will always have conflict about what kind of parenting values, parenting systems, because it's all learned from your family of origin. So right away in the marriage, you're starting off with two parents who probably think quite differently. The issue is that when they disagree, they're living in the same house. So they can go to each other and say, listen, did you tell, did you tell Sally she can go to a concert by herself with her friends? Yeah, well, I didn't think it was a big deal. So they can work it out and work through the conflict, sometimes maybe not, and come to sort of some kind of resolution because they're living in the house and they can pull the, the child or the teenager or whatever it is in and have a family discussion. The problem with co-parenting with parents who live in different homes, and there's a huge difference in this in parents who are warring and parents who aren't warring. The number one rule I set up with every single couple that I work with, whether they're warring or not, is no decisions are made without consulting the other parent because children are genius at splitting. So if the child asks mommy for something and mommy says no and then when they go to daddy, daddy says yes, the child then very quickly learns that they've established quite a good system. I mean, I've actually, once parents started talking to each other, found that kids who were getting double pocket money, double presents, um, double things that neither one of the parents ever bothered to check with the other one if they were actually getting that. So the number one rule, whether you hate each other, love each other, or tolerate each other, is for the sake of your child, if you can set up, and it does, it, luckily today we don't have to talk to each other. We've got email, text, messaging. And as long as it's not abusive, because sometimes parents will use the co-parenting as a war game to um, hurt the other one or have power over the other one, and then it, the co-parenting actually becomes destructive. So one of the things that needs to take place is in couples who aren't warring, there's no reason to not send each other a message about you know, things that, ch that the child asks for or the value systems or how they want to co-parent together. So it's much easier to co-parent in a non-warring situation because you can have a meeting, you can sit down and discuss it, big things together. With warring couples, if, if there is a rule that you only discuss very one, like a one-liner, you know, is, does Sally have piano lesson today? Yeah, it's a one-liner, because Sally's told me she doesn't have to go, but of course Sally has to go, and the mother's paid for it, but Sally's told Dad there is no piano lesson, which then becomes a massive explosion, because the system is so fragile. So the goal of co-parenting is to create a safety net where children can feel safe coming from both homes and both parents. Because I'm a systemic therapist, I work with the system. So the majority of work that I do is with the adults. Although I will have family meetings on behalf of the children with the adults to find out what the issues are. So I will bring the children in with a session with the adults really to find out what the child thinks. And then I'll often refer the children to somebody else because they don't want to see the same therapist as their parents. Um, but when I do a, a family meeting together, the main issue that the children have is that they don't know who to trust and believe. Because if parents are fighting and warring and everybody's playing, and I'm talking about the warring parents, not necessarily the, the ones who are okay working together, but the, but the non-working together, the child feels like they're always in the middle. So even something simply like they have a birthday party and it's the other parent's weekend and they're too scared to ask the other parent and the mother doesn't want to ask the father and then the child always feels like they're drowning in the middle. And so the most important responsibility for the adults is to look at the children's needs, not what your need is, but what is my child need? My child needs a system whereby they can talk to the one parent and then talk to the other parent and not feel like it's a competition between who gets to say yes or no. And that's really what really destroys children. So if the parents can find some mechanism whereby the child needs come above their needs, the system can potentially calm down.
particularly referring to longer term studies, what actually happens to children when the parents continue to war and don't manage to sort all of that out? Well, I have a whole caseload of those 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds. They end up divorced. They end up not trusting relationships. They end up not settling down, um, believing that love can be calm and quiet. They grow up believing that love is war. And then they will replicate that in their future relationships where they will end up in warring relationships and getting divorced is an option because they haven't actually seen what it feels like to be in a safe marriage. Even if one of the, or both of the partners get remarried in a less conflictual relationship, if their primary family, you know, the parents are continuing to war, the message to the child is, that relationships are war. You know, so I often get people in their 50s who've been married three or four times, and when I do their family of origin history, they'll tell me that their parents hated each other, got divorced, lived in separate houses, had a war their whole lives. So they don't feel safe that a marriage is something that's a loving, warm, holding space. It's actually a scary thing that's gonna implode at any minute. So it really is vital to get it right but of course we're all human we all mess up as parents at the best of times you see here's the hope the hope is that children forgive very quickly and that every single child wants to have a happy mommy and daddy no matter how old they are and i've had 30 40 year olds tell me that so if if parents realize that let's say you have been warring and had a really toxic relationship with your ex it's never ever too late to stop it because the child, as soon as they see the shift, it's what they've always wanted. So they'll test it in the beginning to make sure it's real. But as soon as they feel it is real, they very quickly shift into a healthier system of a non-warring relationship. So the hope for parents is that it's never too late to stop the war. Thank you, Karen Baru. Uh, the truth can hurt. That was uh, some rough stuff, I think, for a lot, lot of us uh, co-parents to hear some of that, uh, but it needs to be said. Um, there was a comment from uh, John Davies. Uh, good question, how much does it cost? Yes, obviously, uh, working with someone of Karen's experience, I don't know if you know, psychotherapists are not just your, just a normal counsellor. They've spent many, many years of training and they can deal with some quite deep issues but I'll make sure that Karen's details are available um, once the live streams have done their thing and I can add those details to the comments. So once again thanks for Karen for that and now we're going to come to the learning section so uh, get ready for that. So we're still on Divorce First Aid, which is uh, a big section in the Divorce, divorce Masterclass. Uh, the code there will still give you access to that where you can get whole chunks of it um, uh, without even putting your credit card details in. But uh, obviously I won't keep it like that forever. So if you want to check that out, please do. So we're gonna talk about antiseptic stage, the cleaning wipes. Now we're going to talk about the resisting the urge to sanitise the divorce and shut the door on longer term emotion, emotional side effects too early. We're going to talk about bewaring about beware of unresolved anger and hurt, uh, making sure that's not repressed. But also I want to talk about workplace hell. Divorce is still a taboo subject, and so don't rely on HR to deal with such a private and sensitive life situation. I will start with a quote. Um, author Jared Kintz once wryly stated, I wanted a divorce, so I bought myself a house to give me the incentive to stay married. That's an interesting way of thinking about it. So wipe away the tears, make it all sanitised. That's what we're encouraged to do um, quite early on in the divorce process. And there's some danger in that. People will suppress their anger and their hurt if no one is willing to listen. However, there is a balancing act for those around them. You don't want them to fall into victimhood either. So my, my advice is for you not to see them as a victim. Uh, if the people that you know who are right now going through divorce and family separation, uh, see them just as you. No one is immune to divorce and family breakup. 
I certainly thought I was. I never dreamed for one moment that my kid's dad would one day reveal he wasn't happy and that our relationship would end literally overnight. Divorce and family breakup is messy. You can wipe away the surface tears, but what about what lies lurking below? The ripples of divorce affect much, much more than just the immediate family over a long period of time, especially if the breakup involves litigation. And in the workplace, that can be hell. Stress is the number one reason for absenteeism at work. And that was a conclusion uh, by the CIPD Simply Health Absence Survey way back in October 2011. Stress impacts negatively on employee absence rates, on the morale of fellow colleagues working in the same teams and on the company's bottom line. So what seems not yet to be measured very well in the UK, but is it anecdotally, anecdotally a real life problem for employers, is the day to day real lives of their employees, which can, of course, um, they can be turn hard working, reliable staff and cause them to dissolve in over into overstressed, emotionally delicate workers who are suffering from that all too common life situation called family breakup or to use another, sometimes almost taboo word, or so it seems, divorce. As the creator of the Alternative Divorce Guide, which is a, basically a travel guide to stay out of court divorce, I often hear claims from employers that their employees' private lives are beyond their control, none of their business. Well, of course they are, but the question I ask is why avoid sharing information on how those employees can get support and help outside of their employment assistance programme and empowering them to avoid adversarial divorce, which will only impact negatively on their families and on their work, just because there appears to be such a social stigma all around the subject of divorce. And did I say outside their employment assistance programme? Yes, so because privacy is key. So especially in the early stages, employees need an independent source of information that may be sponsored by their employers, but must remain separate from them. HR may treat employees' uh, family issues as confidential, but rightly or wrongly, the employees may not always believe that to be the case. Employers need to provide a broader, more interventionist approach, but keep out of the private lives of their employees. The UK law clearly states a duty exists for all employers to undertake an adequate risk assessment. This is in addition to employers' general duty of care required by Section 2 of the Health and Safety of Work Act 1974. An employee from O2 was awarded in excess of £100,000 in compensation in 2008, essentially because she had asked for a less stressful role in the workplace. But action was slow and after three months the stress provided to, proved to be too much for her to cope with. Though such a, uh, through such a large compensation award, employers were sent a clear message that duty of care must be clearly demonstrated to avoid possible legal action. Employment Law Watch concludes that the case is important because the Court of Appeal has made it clear that in cases of severe stress, it is not enough for an employer to provide access to a confidential counselling helpline or to refer an employee to an occupational health professional. It is likely that a more interventionist approach to managing stress is required of managers and HR professionals following this case. So divorce impacts heavily on the workplace because it increases the financial pressures, emotional turmoil and absence rates in employees. And this impacts directly on the company's bottom line. Traditional employment assistance, let's say that again, employment assistance programs are not always targeted at specific life crises like divorce and family breakup. And employees often do not access them because they need a private resource that is not under the auspices of their company. In other words, it is it is vital that any realistic help to be offered to people going through the family breakup needs to be outside of the EAP and independent of the employer, otherwise many staff will simply not use what is offered because they want to keep their private life out of the workplace even if they are unable to spare their employer the consequences of their life crisis. Or because they fear that in a time of recession their job prospects will be impacted if employers know 
that they are going through a divorce. I've had come across that one quite a few times. I recently spoke to a professional woman uh, who's convinced that her work contract was not renewed as a direct result of her employer knowing that she may be divorcing. And as, and as then a single mother, she was deemed less likely to be able to cope with the travelling involved in the job, even though she's well able to arrange childcare. What will be interesting to see over the, the coming years is how many companies take up the free offer of giving their staff access to online resource, resources such as the ones that I offer. I've found a reluctance in HR to share these free resources because I believe there's still a lot of a fear around tackling sensitive issues like divorce. So if your company is giving you easy access to a free resource that can guide your friends, family and work colleagues and yourself through less stressful family breakup, you're one of the lucky ones and please do share it, share it with me, I want to know about it and so I can congratulate your employers. Do we have a cultural issue at play here? Is divorce and family breakup such a taboo subject that employers just don't want to engage with the reality of their employees' personal lives? Uh, I was told by the uh, creator of a local well-being event that in his dealings with employers he never uses the word stress, he speaks only of well-being. It is as if by accepting that stress exists the employer is admitting to some kind of sin. Is it not time for employers to take their heads out of the sand and accept that employees' personal lives will not only impact on their bottom line but also could result in litigation that could cost that employer a large sum in, in money. A while back I read online that some law firms are receiving payments from local employers who are covering the cost of an employee's divorce. This is understandable, especially in a smaller business where a key team member is struggling with not only the emotional fallout but the financial cost of a litigious divorce. But would those firms not be better off encouraging stay out of court divorce by making key information accessible at an early stage? If employees use mediation or collaborative law, they're likely to suffer much less stress and avoid high ongoing costs. We'll finish with a quote from PJ O'Rourke. He showed he knew a thing or two about society's prejudice against divorce when he said, staying married may have long-term benefits. You can elicit much more sympathy from friends over a bad marriage than you ever can from a good divorce. We're going to now come to a pre-recorded shared story that I'd like you to listen to. Um, it's uh, not the perfect quality, but it's one of those ones I've grabbed online. And this is Rara and uh, she says some lovely things, so I hope you find this uplifting. Everybody says to you when, when something dramatic happens in your life that you change in some way or another and it, it, it is meant to be good for you. So in the early stages of being separated in, in a divorce or separation or whatever is very, very difficult. But it's really trying to find your path the way through. And I became homeless through divorce and arrived back in London about six years ago. And that's where my journey really began. My life completely changed. I was madly in love with my husband and my life completely changed. And I have this wonderful saying, adversity brings you two things, a lesson and a blessing and I and it's normally in that way so I got the lesson pretty quickly and um, the blessing is now with me now so I'm I'm really happy where I am and where I've got to in 13 years and actually quite proud of where I've got to I had a moment of complete dismantlement and and when when somebody says your heart aches I had a session for about three weeks where I really could have pulled I thought I was having a heart attack I really could have pulled my heart out. Now, if I hadn't had my children around me, I think I probably would have been very more dismantled in that, but they were grieving as well. So I had to hang on and look after them as well as myself. And that was very complicated. So trying to get through that period was tremendously difficult. Uh, and I went back to grassroots. I painted, I, I used to paint a lot. I started to paint, I'd never sculpted and I longed to sculpt, so I started a, a session with Morley College, funnily enough, in London near Waterloo, 
and had the most lovely time there putting my hands in clay. And funnily enough, when I put my hands in the clay, I burst into tears. So there was something very therapeutic about that. I run a small divorce area called CKRP, which really just is where you can discuss the, the private sides of what you don't want to tell your friends. All I wanted to do was to help the homeless because I was homeless and I'm an ambassador of two homeless um, non-profits and what we've done on the streets over COVID has been amazing. I didn't realize how many tears I had until eventually I couldn't stop crying any longer because I was completely devastated when my husband left and I just cried and cried and cried and eventually your tears stop and you, you're sort of left with a void, you don't really know what to do and, and eventually I sort of thought well I've got to improve myself somehow or another. So I had, took singing lessons and for my per first two singing lessons two things shocked me. One was I cried every single minute of the first lesson <laughs> and possibly some of the second. So the poor man I think thought goodness me she's real trouble. And the second thing was that I couldn't remember anything. So he said, now sing that again. And I couldn't even remember what I'd sung. And that really frightened me. And it's, there's a loss that you have in, when you have trauma, you lose certain sides of your brain. And it took a very long time. I'm not sure I'm not right anyhow, <laughs> any, but, but it took a very long time to gain that thought process and the memory process again. And that was what fascinated me. So I sang and I was lucky enough to sing an album. When I'm mentoring now, which I absolutely love, so I always say to them, go back to something that you used to love. What did you do? Which, you know, which part of your life did you, which was tactile with a pen or a pencil or sewing or something that you used to love, try and go back to that because there's great therapy in that or try and learn a skill. You know, I belong to play the drums. I've had two sessions on the drums. It's given me great spirit. I, if I had a drum set, I'd drive everybody mad. Thank you, Rara. Um, Rara went on to, as she did mention there, run a, a support group for people going through divorce, and I'll be adding links to that to all the online uh, videos. Just a reaction, thank you for those who are sending in um, constructive messages. Uh, Linda Morris, uh, if you're, I see you on Facebook, if you're not already in the Best Way to Divorce Facebook group, about to have a QR code for that come up in a minute, please do uh, join that and pop your question in there and, and I can probably help you. But obviously I don't have time to give you a full answer to that, but come on into the Best Way to Divorce Facebook group. You can find it on Facebook and uh, I'd be happy to help you out. And thank you, Wazar Best, for your comments. You're saying that uh, divorced but happy. Um, I find that most people are happy as long as their children are happy and the children are happier as long as both parents are happy that can be the challenge but it's definitely something to always aim for so we're going to do a quick roundup now and then we're going to have our healing session so get yourself ready um first of all i just want to share the uh, workshop apologies i should have the qr code because we've actually got a date now 10th of september but i'll definitely have that for next friday and you can you can start booking in for that but if you use this one and go on to the waiting list you will get a code that means you can access it uh, for only 20 pounds and the divorce financial workshops this is for people in the uk would love to run some in the us but these are for the anyone in the uk and you will find them extremely useful here is the Facebook group uh, QR code, or simply go on to Facebook, put blah, Facebook, and put in "best way to divorce," and you'll see the group come up. Uh, you'll be very welcome. That's uh, it's an international group. We have UK, uh, USA. We do have others, and I am pulling together information for other countries as well. And the secret divorce group is my lovely little group where uh, it is you get 30 days free if you use this QR code and then there's a, a payment but it's not very much and that's just a great place to have ongoing support and I've got lots of resources in there it just helps me manage uh, to give people ongoing support without me um, going mad because I couldn't do it all by email and phone and we're now preparing for our healing I'm going to put the healing slide on now And welcome, Courtney. OK, 
Can you hear me not loud Hi, and clear? Susie. Excellent. I can hear you loud and clear. So, what are you going to be doing for us today? And but thank you so much for coming on and joining us. So, what what are we up to? Thank you for having me, Susie. I'm a trauma and tension releasing exercise provider and a quantum energy coach. But today, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about TRE, which is trauma and tension releasing exercises. It's about letting the body let go of stress and tension that sits in the body and just let it go naturally as nature intended. Um, so I actually fell into it. Uh, my daughters and I were involved in a harrowing hijacking, which was traumatic beyond words, as you can imagine. And I tried all the different therapies, everything from mainstream, everything from the natural side as well. And I just, I thought I was healed. Because as a parent, you just try and rationalize, keep everything in the mind, try and pretend, make sure everything's fine. And you just keep talking to yourself and thinking, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I've got to get over this, got to move forward. But my daughter, my five-year-old daughter was my benchmark because she kept ducking down at the back of the car all the time we'd get into the car. And I just knew, I can't live like this and she can't carry on her life like this. So I knew I just had to keep searching for the right thing. And that's when I found TRE. It is amazing. It's the body's natural response to trauma and tension. And if you look at children from the very young age till about the age of 10, they would naturally quiver and tremor um, and shake when they have a big fright or a big incident would happen. Um, and society has conditioned us to stop tremoring. We kind of clench our jaws, tighten our muscles and just keep it together because shaking is seen as being vulnerable and a sign of weakness. So we just don't do it anymore. And David Baselli, who came up with TRE, actually was working in war-torn countries, and he could see exactly what was happening. The little kids were quivering on his lap, and all the adults were holding it together. And in the afternoons, all the adults were either in a heightened state of um, anger and irritation, that, that fight-or-flight mode, or even freeze, completely dissociated, that the mind and the body completely separate. And the children were running around playing football and laughing as if nothing had ever happened. And that's when he went into it further. But for me, it's amazing. The body has a natural innate healing mechanism. And if we just give it time to heal, it can do its own thing. So today, I can't teach you how to tremor in 10 minutes, unfortunately. That I'd have to do another time. But what I can do is just try and increase the mind-body loop. Because in a heightened state, and divorce is just the same as any other trauma, you're in that heightened state, your earlier um, colleague, Karen, she spoke of uh, the war zone, in the anger, loss, resentment, all of those emotions that are hitting us at that heightened state. We don't think rationally. We're not in that state. We just, it's a survival mode. So we're doing everything we can to protect ourselves and protect our kids. Um, and in that state, we go into overwhelm. And the other lady as well was talking about emotion and just crying, crying, crying. That is complete overwhelm. We hit that tipping point where we just overrun by emotion. So the beauty of our TRE is once you learn it, you only need six sessions with a, with a registered provider and literally bring your nervous system all the way down to baseline. It will give you that much more room to maneuver. Your body and your mind, everything is back in, um, in coherent state and you can function at a, at a baseline without being triggered, without that anger and resentment, but just back down to normal. So I'm going to start today with just do three exercises for you. So the first exercise, we're going to stand on the mat. Excuse me for bending because my earphones unfortunately don't reach further. So if you could stand up while you do this exercise, stand up nice and tall. And I want you to place your feet hip distance apart, if you can see mine here. And I want you to bend your knees. And all I want you to do is roll over onto the sides of your feet. And I want you to feel the stretch on the outside of the one foot and the inside of the other. And I want you to stand nice and tall, relax your shoulders and relax your toes. It's a bit of a weird stretch. It's almost like a skiing position. Put your hands on your belly and slowly take a nice deep in breath. And as you inhale, let your belly swell. So push your belly out and breathe in for the count of three. And then slowly exhale for the count of five. Good. And then we're going to go through to the other side. So move the feet to the other side. Keep the knees bent. Really connect. I want your mind to really focus on that stretch in the ankles. 
Okay. Again, breathe in for the count of three. Let the belly swell. And breathe out for the count of five. Good. And again, to the other side. Breathe in for the count of three. And breathe out for the count of five. If we could only breathe, consciously breathe as humans, you'd be surprised how we'd adapt to most things that happen to us. So breathe in again. Really connecting with that stretch. And breathe out for five. Beautiful. And then I want you to shake it out. So give it a good shake. Shake your foot. And just rotate each ankle round and round, really stopping that stretch in its tracks. Good. The next exercise we're going to do is legs nice and wide apart, feet facing forward. And I just want you to bend your knees. And I literally want you just to hang forward. So just hang down. Just relax. Drop the head. Relax the shoulders. Relax the jaw. Unhinge the jaw if you can. Just drop it open. And I want you to connect with that inner thigh stretch that you have. Can you connect with that inner thigh stretch that you're feeling? Or anywhere else that you feel that stretch. Just connect with the body. And take the three nice deep breaths into your belly. Good. And then we're going to slowly walk your hands to the right foot. Bend the right knee and straighten the left. And just connect with that stretch on the left, that inner thigh stretch. Again, drop the head. Relax the shoulders. Unhinge the jaw. Relax it. Even try and relax your eyeballs. I know it sounds weird, but just let them roll gently back into the sockets. And take three nice deep breaths into your belly. Beautiful. And then slowly walk your hands through to the other side. Bend the left knee, straighten the right. Good. And connect with that stretch. Beautiful. Drop the head. Relax the shoulders. Unhinge the jaw. Good. So by doing this, we're really connecting with each part of the body and just reconnecting that wiring that comes from each of our body parts. Gently come back to center. Soften the knees. Bend the knees some more. And I want you to walk your hands gently through your feet towards the back of the, wall, back of the room. And again, drop the head. Relax the shoulders and just connect with that stretch. You might feel it around the back of the glutes or the back of the thighs. Just connect with whatever you're feeling. Good. Put your hands on your knees and slowly, slowly roll up. You might feel a little lightheaded, but just take it easy. Good. And then just give it a good shake. Shake the body. Good. The next, the last exercise I'm just going to take you through is the psoas stretch. The psoas is the most important muscle, the only muscle that joins the upper half of the body to the lower half. And it's the muscle that actually brings us forward when we tense in any situation, any type of trauma or anything that's going on in our life. Even if you get a quite a quite a serious email, sometimes I find myself, I go, oh my gosh, what are you doing? You've stopped breathing. And you've hunched forward. We naturally, it's our basic instinct to bring our, bring ourselves forward. And that with contracting that, that muscle, you're contracting all the muscles in the body, slowly but surely. And if we don't release that, that contraction, that energy, that charge heightens our how we're feeling and also becomes discomfort, aches and pains, dis-ease, everything else that we know about. So let's connect here. You're going to go on your knee. If you need something underneath your knee, just put a blanket or a pillow. Now you're going to put your right leg forward. And I want you to put your right knee in alignment with your right hip. And I want you to scoot your toes forward so you can see all five toes quite clearly visible from this upright position. And put your hands on your knees for stability. And hold on if you need to. Don't be shy. And then lunge forward. Beautiful. And you'll feel the stretch in this hip flexor here. Oh. Gorgeous stretch. Gets me every time. Drop the shoulders. Relax the belly. And just take three deep breaths into the belly. It's a really beautiful stretch. Good. 
And then after your third breath, you're going to stay forward in your lunge. And I just want you to rotate round to the right shoulder. Look over the right shoulder as much as you can. Feel that stretch go further up into the psoas, right up here into the stomach. And again, three deep breaths into your belly. Good. And then we're going to come out of that and we're going to do the other side. Just lunge forward. Make sure your left knee is lambed with your hip. Scoot your toes forward. Lunge forward. Make sure your toes are not underneath your knee. Good. Drop the shoulders. Relax the belly. Beautiful. Enjoy that air into the belly. Good. And then again, stay forward and then just twist to the side. Feel that stretch further up into the stomach. Good. And then you're going to slowly come back and you're going to stand up and just give it a good shake. So those are the only three exercises I'm going to show you today. Um, if I could see you ordinarily, you would go through all seven exercises and then you would lie down and the body would be, start a natural, beautiful little tremor. It's a tiny little shake and it's, it's a beautiful feeling. Um, some people say it's weird. It is weird first up but it's not foreign. It's the same mechanism that you have when you have a fever or when you have um, the shivers, when you're icy cold, the body needs to try and regulate the body temperature. It's exactly the same thing. So by shaking, you're shaking off all your stress and tension, letting off steam and actually coming out much lighter and happier and with the spring in your step. I do hope that you all take up, look up, look out for a nice TRE provider near you. Otherwise I'm also available over Zoom. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Courtney. And uh, um, uh, I shall definitely be trying this again later properly when I have a bit more space to do it. Um, so when I, I'll let you know when the um, when's a good time to add your details. But if you'd be OK to add those to the comments of uh, of the various streams. Yeah. Yes, Fan absolutely. Fantastic. And you work to Zoom so people anywhere can access you absolutely perfect that's lovely thank you so much for being on the show it's been a real pleasure to to have you here thank you thank you so much bye so um a little bit flushed i was trying to do some of it but it's a bit difficult where i'm sitting at the moment um another lovely finale to the show always good to get back into your body because we talk about some quite heavy stuff during the show and as we all know on the battlefield of divorce and in the war of family separation always always make peace your weapon of choice 